Okay, we are now recording. So welcome to the April 8th uh, online physics class. Um, does anybody have any questions before we get into the homework? Questions about how the class is run or actually, can you guys all hear me okay? Can you please uh, let me know if you can hear me? Okay, good. All right. Okay, that's reassuring. So no questions about anything? All right, I'll take that for a no. Oh, you like the headset better. Oh, okay. Okay, I did bring it. Okay, hang on while I switch over to that. Okay, so we're using the headset now. Do you guys agree that the headset is better? Sure, yeah. Oh, Ian says no, but everybody else says yes. So Ian, looks like you get outvoted. All right, we will be using the headset. Okay, so let's get into the goodies. All right, so here are the answers to the quiz questions. So first off, if you've got a positively charged object in a magnetic field, if the object is not moving, it will not feel any force at all. Get roasted. <laughs> okay. All right. So if it's not moving, it will not feel any force. Okay. If it is moving, then it might feel a force. Now, this is one thing that I didn't talk about in detail last time. In fact, I may not even mention it at all. One thing that's important is the direction that it's moving. So you can see here uh, on the quiz here, depending on the direction that it's moving, it might not feel a force, but the odds of that are pretty, pretty slim. There's, there's, there's only two directions that it might possibly be moving where it wouldn't feel a force. Any other direction other than that, and it will feel a force. We're going to talk more about it, that today. In fact, that is the whole the whole purpose of today's um, activity is, is moving charges. So we'll talk in more detail about this later. Um, but uh, yeah, you have to be moving in order to have any hope of, uh, of it feeling a force. Okay, so at the most basic level, what causes magnetism? Well, a charged particle in motion. Our secret phrase was oscillation over thruster. And by the way, Milo, I went and looked up Buckaroo Banzai, and once once I saw it, then I remembered. Oh yeah, I saw that. That was that was a really goofy film. It's the kind of film I'm not surprised to hear that you would have liked. But yeah, that, that if you if you guys haven't seen it, you might want to. It it's definitely goofy. But uh, oh well. Uh, okay, now did any of you get out a battery and a, and a nail and some wire did any of you make a magnet like i asked you to because it looks like most of you got cheated in your junior high school your, your junior high school teacher really should have done this for you i need to see some responses here yay or nay did anybody do it nope oh you guys i'm so disappointed obviously obviously what Oh, you couldn't get wire? Okay, well, okay, anyway, I, it, this is pretty basic. If, if you ever get any, uh, if you ever find some time in your board, do this and you'll find out it works pretty well. Okay, so here are the answers to last night's homework, at least, at least the ones you haven't already looked up. Okay, so I'll give you a minute to look those over. Now, Number 10 and number 13 I want to discuss, but before, before we get into those, do any of you have a question? Okay, in seventh grade, you did, okay. All right, so I'm glad to see that Kiker at least got his money's worth from junior high school. The rest of you guys, you really ought to sue your junior high school science teacher for malpractice if he or she didn't do this. Can we talk about number six, you bet. What do you wanna know about number six? Oh. Number six, thank you for, uh, yes. Number six, I don't recall the book ever telling you something that you needed to know in order to do number six. Uh, you need to know that the force, so if you've got a long wire and it's creating a magnetic field, 
Uh, so if you're anywhere near that wire, if you double the distance away from the wire, the amount of force that you feel drops by one half. So if you triple it, it drops to one third. Uh, the book never told you that, at least not that I saw it. Did, did anybody see anywhere in the book where it told you that? So uh, yeah, what that's kind of- What see was the thing earlier in the book where it's saying how much force it felt based on how far away it was being like the over D squared. Where, where was that? I don't remember seeing that. It was, it was in one of the previous chapters, but it, I know it isn't. Oh. Uh, okay, in one of the previous chapters. Okay, that's possible. That's possible. So anyway. Uh, no, it, it ended up squaring it, not just being one over R. Okay, well, then it's different. That's not the case. Because if you're, if you're near a, a long wire, the force is proportional, inversely proportional to the distance from the wire. And that's not something that the book talked about in that chapter. And, and so this is a wig point for the author there. Uh, uh, he or she should have should have told you that. Now, when you guys take uh, the University of Utah Physics next year, which I hope you guys all will, uh, then uh, at that point you're actually going to prove you're going you're going to derive the equation uh, in the U of U Physics class, and you'll find out that this is the case. All right. So Annie is saying that it was way back in the electromagnetism section. Okay. And now I guess that's, that's the problem we have when we skip around in the book is sometimes we skip over important stuff. But anyway, so Ellie, so uh, assuming that, uh, that you somehow magically knew this, uh, now does question number six make sense? So Ellie, give me some response on, do I need to say any more or does that answer your question? Okay, good. All right. Mr. Hendricks. Yes, sir. If it's one over R and you move it two times away, wouldn't the force be one half? That's correct. But it says it'll be two times stronger on well, A. The way the question was worded, if I remember right, is that it's asking what is the force on an object that's close compared to an object that's twice as far away, okay? So the force on the object that's closer will be stronger. It'll be two times the one that's further away. Uh, it, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's the way they worded the question. Okay, so uh, somebody was asking about number eight here. Okay. Ah, okay, so question number eight. Um, Here's how I came up with my answer. Earlier in the book, it did say that iron would end up being a strong core, but I noticed something else also in the book. It's that yeah. aluminum ends up becoming a permanent magnet. So I went with iron because you can make it a temporary magnet that's also very strong. Okay. Putting okay, I think you misunderstood something there. Aluminum does not become a perfect magnet. Um, I, I didn't say perfect. Okay, but it doesn't even become one at all. Uh, so the, the reason you want to use iron is because if you look at an individual iron molecule, just one molecule all by itself, it is a little magnet. Okay, and that's not the case for all elements. Uh, a lot of elements, in fact, most of the elements, if you look at the individual molecule, it's probably not going to be a magnet. Because remember how we said it depends on the electron structure inside the uh, atom. Okay, so, so iron, each little molecule is a pretty darn good magnet. But in regularly naturally occurring iron, um, each one of those molecules is oriented some, some randomly different way, so they all cancel each other out. Um, so if you, take the, if you take a nail or some piece that's made out of iron and you wrap the wire around it and then turn on the electric field, the electric field is going to cause those randomly oriented iron molecules to reorient. And so in addition to the magnetic field that's coming from the coil, the coiled wire, you're also going to get the added effect of the magnetic field from each one of the uh, little iron molecules. And so what's going to happen is that electromagnet that you made is going to be way stronger than it would have been had you not used an iron core. And other materials like glass or wood or many other types of, of metals, um, they don't have that, that uh, effect. And by the way, that, that effect is called ferromagnetism. Ferro for ferrous for iron. So other molecules, other uh, elements don't have that effect. Iron does. So does that answer your question about number eight? Mr. Hendricks, I have a question about number four. Okay, hang on a sec before we do that. Uh, so I need to know about number eight. Are we good on number eight? 
So Maddie, you were the one that asked. So Maddie, are you good? Okay, good. All right, okay, uh, Josh, go ahead. So I thought it was because, so the question asked um, about why um, a compass might be wrong in its reading. Uh -huh. And I thought it was because um, the pole, the magnetic pole and the north-south pole are aligned differently. Uh, so if you're too far north, it won't be correct. Okay, what you said is a true statement. Cannot argue with that. Uh, that wasn't what they were getting at, though. What, if, if you were to take a, a compass and you go around the, comp the country or the world, um, what you're going to find is that there are certain places where the compass is wrong, and it's not because of what you just described. Um, I used to live in California, you know, in Silicon Valley. You guys have heard about Silicon Valley. It's the San Jose uh, area in California. There's a place there that's called the mystery spot. And uh, so if you go there, you'll find out that the compasses don't point the right direction. And so, so some, somebody made a big deal of it and they, they promote it as being the mystery spot and, and they, they, uh, they pay people <laughs> to come in and see that. And then they also have a bunch of other cool stuff that they brought in, just kind of goofy stuff. It's neat. So, so Josh, what you said is true, but that's not really what they were asking about. Okay, now let's talk about number 10. Uh, so number 10, the question is, are magnetic fields really truly a, a thing that really truly exists or are, they, or are they just a mathematical convenience that makes it easier to calculate stuff? Uh, and the answer is that it, fields are very real. Magnetic field, so magnetic line. fields. I, I, in the book, it said something like the magnetic lines are used to just describe how it describes okay. the field is Th real. Thank you for that. Hey, Jaron, can you do me a favor? In the future, can you please uh, type in your questions or maybe raise your hand and ask uh, to be called on? Uh, rather than just uh, jumping in with your comments. Uh, I would appreciate it. It would allow the flow of the class to go a little bit more smoothly. So I'd appreciate it if you didn't just jump in like that. Um, okay, so magnetic fields are very real uh, things. It's like an electric field. Um, remember how I love, one of my favorite expressions is empty space isn't really empty, right? Uh, because there is this thing that's called the fabric of the universe. And so uh, what's happening is if you have a magnet, it is stretching the fabric of the universe in the vicinity around that magnet. The, the, the universe is actually different because of the magnet sitting there. Okay, it is stretching the, the fabric of the universe. And it is a very real thing. Okay, there, this, this fabric that of the universe that I, that I like to talk about is, is not just some, some mathematical construct that makes things easier to calculate. It's very, very real. Okay, and number 13, I wanted to discuss that, except I've forgotten. I've forgotten what question number 13 was asking. Oh yes, the right hand rule. Okay. All right. Okay. So number 13, it was asking you to describe the right hand rule. Um, okay. So I would like to know how you guys go about describing it. Uh, if someone, uh, okay, Joseph, uh, let, I'll get to your question in just a minute. Does somebody want to turn on their mic uh, temporarily and tell me how you would describe to someone say in junior high school, how would you describe the right hand rule? So if you just hold down the uh, space key on your com computer, it'll temporarily turn on your mic. Anybody wanna take a shot at that? Uh, what I said was the current flows in the same direction as your fingers uh, would were you to wrap your right hand around the, I don't know, nail. Okay. All right, and so if you, write, if you wrap your fingers so that your fingers are curling in the same way that the current is running, then your thumb is going to point in the, mag the direction of the magnetic field. So that, that's a good way to describe it. 
Okay, so Joseph is asking, why does the Bermuda Triangle make mal compasses malfunction? And I can tell you from firsthand experience that that's actually not the case. The Bermuda Triangle, there's so many myths, uh, so many misconceptions about the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, the, it, the, the Bermuda Triangle, I've sailed through there a lot and the compass works just fine. Uh, the reason the Bermuda Triangle is so famous is because there have been so many shipwrecks in the Bermuda Triangle. And the reason for that is because the waters uh, in that part of the ocean are very shallow and there's lots of places where there's a rock hiding just, be, just below the water surface. And so if you're sailing along and you don't know that that rock's there, you're going to hit the rock and you're going to you know, your boat's going to sink. And because there were so many ships that got sunk in that area, that's why the Bermuda Triangle is, is so infamous. Um, has nothing to do with that. Okay, so Annie is asking, or Anna, sorry. Anna is asking, how do you know where the current is flowing? Okay, so let me go back up to this one right here. Okay, so the people who first experimented with electricity, they had a bunch of batteries and so they arbitrarily decided okay this side of the battery we're going to call the plus side this side of the battery we're going to call the minus side and they knew that something was flowing through the wire they didn't really know what it was this was way back before people had even learned that there was such a thing as an electron and so they knew that something was flowing and it was either going from the positive side to the negative side or negative to positive they just flipped a coin and they just said, well, okay, let's suppose that it's going from the positive side to the negative side. All right, so if you hook something up to a battery, we are going to assume that whatever is flowing is flowing from the positive side to the negative side. So, so Anna, that's the answer to your question, is we assume that it's going from positive to negative. Now, I'm pretty sure I mentioned this last time. It turned out that they were wrong. Okay, once people figured out that there was such a thing as an electron, uh, and they, they realize that it's actually electrons flowing. So in reality, it's electrons are flowing from the negative side to the positive side. But people didn't figure that out until after they had already written a whole bunch of textbooks and trained a whole bunch of people, all based on the assumption that it's going from positive to negative. So we still stick with that exact same convention now, even though we now know it's not completely right. The mathematics works out just fine. Okay, so we assume you're going from positive to minus. Okay, so, so BR, I'm not sure who, B, hey BR, who are you? Who is BR? So BR is saying that it's flowing from the negative to the positive, so that's basically what I just said, but we don't actually do that. In all of physics, even the University of Utah physics, everything is still based on the assumption that it's flowing from the positive to the negative. Oh, BR is Bridget. Ah, okay. All right. Hi, Bridget. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions on the homework before we move on to tonight's stuff? Nope. Okay. All right. Let's move on to tonight's stuff. Okay. So quickly, just a little bit of review first. Okay, so if a charged particle is moving through a magnetic field, and notice I bolted moving, okay, you have to be moving, then you can have a force on that particle. And keep in mind that the force is not going to be either attracted toward the magnet or away from it. The, the force is gonna be off at 90 degrees in some weird direction, which is, which is very, very strange, okay? But only if it's moving, Okay, so in this particular case, the force on the object is gonna be out of the page. So when scientists did a bunch of experiments, okay, and they, they got a magnetic field here and they get the, the particle moving through it, okay, they found out just experimentally that if it's moving as shown here, they've, they noticed that the force is always coming upward out of the page. Whereas if it's moving the opposite direction, as shown here, when they do the experiment, they find in this case, the force goes into the page. And this is all just experimentally observed. This is what things do, okay? So the, the way to figure this out is using the right-hand rule again. This time, 
we're going to call this, or the book anyway, calls this the third right hand rule. And so this is how you know what direction he uh, is going to be, the force is going to be acting on some object. So first off, it has to be a positively charged object. If it's negative, then, it, then it's going to be the exact opposite of what we're describing here. So it has to be a positively charged object. Okay, so what you do is you take your hand and you point your hand so that your thumb is pointing in the direction that the positively charged object is moving. So let's say that my pen here is the positively charged object and the pointy part of the end of the pen is telling me what direction it's moving. So I take my hand, I, I open it up like this, I put it so that the thumb is pointing the direction that the positively charged object is moving. And then my fingers, I want to point them in the direction that the magnetic field is pointing. And magnetic fields are also called B fields. We use the letter B to represent magnetic fields, presumably because there were too many other things that started with the letter M. Um, and so people didn't want to confuse that. So, so you see right here, it's talking about the magnetic field and it says B. Okay. So my fingers are going to be pointing in the direction of the magnetic field. So, so so thumb in the direction that the positive charge is moving, fingers go in the direction that wherever the magnetic field happens to be, and then coming out of my palm, that tells me what direction the force is gonna be. So this is called the right hand rule. The book calls it the third right hand rule. So let's take a minute here and let's, let's see if this works. Okay, so everybody get, get your fingers in your hands here and do the hand dance. Yes, it's three dimensional. It is very definitely three dimensional. So let's all do the hand dance. So take your thumb and point your thumb in the direction that the positive charge is moving here. And then those, the black arrows that you see, okay, that's the magnetic field also called the B field. Okay, so you got your thumb going that way and then you, get, you wanna or get your fingers right. So the fingers are pointing in the direction of the magnetic field. And so then your palm coming out of your palm like this, okay, that tells you the direction that the force is gonna be. When you guys do that, do you get uh, that your palm is pointing out of the page? Every, give me a couple of yays or nays, everybody okay? Do you agree that it, the force is gonna be out of the page? Yeah, I see a yay. Okay, good, all right. And then, so now here, here's one for you. And let's see if the polling feature works. I've been playing around with a little polling feature here. Okay, all right, good. It looks like it's working this time. Okay, so I want everybody to answer this question. So don't type it into the chat box this time. This time, uh, choose it in here. Uh, one of these options. So looking at the picture, what you see right here, okay, the charge is moving that direction. The uh, magnetic field. You, you might want to move the uh, the window open. If you if you grab the the window and move it off to the right, make it a little easier to see. Okay, so I see. Wow, I see answers all over the place. My goodness. So keep going. So far, only eight of you have answered. Okay, keep going. Oh boy, this is really interesting. About a third of you are saying it's coming out of the page. About a third of you are saying it's going into the page. A few of you are saying it's going to the right and a few of you are saying that it's going upward. Mm. This is not reassuring. Not reassuring at all. Okay, let's get the rest of you. So far only 15 of you have answered. The rest of you still need to answer. I want everybody to call in on this one. What direction is the force going to be? We're up to 16, 17. Come on, there's still more of you. There's 39 of you out there. I need more people responding. Okay, it looks like one of the choices is now emerging. At least they're, they're one of the choices we got the majority of the people are voting for now. Okay, I guess the rest of you aren't gonna respond, so, okay. So uh, the answer that I'm seeing the most is most people are saying that it's coming out of the page, but there's quite a few who are saying it differently. 
Okay, so let's see now. Okay, so what direction does the thumb point? It points in the direction that the charge is moving. So the, my thumb should be going to the right as I look at it. My fingers, they should be going in the direction of the magnetic field, which is down. Okay, so if I do it like this, oops, that doesn't work. Okay, so I'm gonna have to turn it like this. Okay, so my thumb is going to the right, my fingers are going down, so my palm is going in to the page. Now, those of you that did it, that got the wrong answer, maybe you were using your left hand. Remember, it has to be a right, right hand, okay? So when I do this, I get that the direction of the force is into the page. All right, so this is clearly something that you guys need a little bit more practice with, okay? Now, what if it was a negative charge, okay? Well, if it's a negative charge, then it's gonna be the exact opposite of, our, of, of what it would be if it was a, a positive charge. So what you could do is you just use the right hand rule, see what the right hand rule gives you, and then know that it's gonna be the opposite of that. Or another thing that you can do is if it's a negative charge, just use your left hand and that will work too. Okay. All right, now, uh, we do have three-dimensional things. So Josh was asking, is it a three-dimensional thing? Yes, it's very definitely three-dimensional. So we, we've got to figure out some way where we can draw vectors um, so that if the, director is going, if the direction of the vector is going into the page or out of the page, we need some way to show that. So what you see right here is a way of doing it. So, if, so I like to imagine that it's a little arrow here and it's got an arrow head and then on the back, the arrow has some tail feathers. Okay, so if the vector, if the arrow is coming right straight at you, okay, so, so here's, here's the arrow, here's the pointy part, imagine that there's feathers on this part. If the arrow is coming right straight towards you, you're going to see the point of the arrow. Okay, so this picture that you see right here, that dot in the middle, is intended to represent the point of the arrow as the arrow comes right straight towards you. So if we draw a circle like this with a dot, that's our way of saying that the, air, that the vector is coming out of the page directly at you. Now, if we draw the thing like this, where you see the X, that's the feathers of the, of the arrow. So in that case, the arrow is not coming towards you. The arrow is going away from you. So imagine that there are feathers here, okay? So if you see, are seeing the, uh, the tail feathers of the arrow, that means it's going away from you, which means it's going into the page, okay? All right, so this is the convention that we're gonna be using now for the rest of the year. And this is common, everybody in the world uses the same convention, okay? All right, so here's a problem like you're gonna see in the homework tonight. Well, down here in the lower left of the screen, We've got a positively charged object that's traveling through space and, or maybe it's going this way, depending, okay, this, your, re, re, your uh, view is reversed from mine. Okay, so the thing is moving to the right and, it's, and at first it's traveling through empty space, okay? There's no magnetic field, there's no nothing. It's just traveling along, minding its own business, not bothering anybody, going in a straight line and then it enters a region of space where there's a magnetic field. So how would we get a magnetic field? Well, we would take a North Pole and a South Pole and we'd put them together. So, so basically here's what we have. So we have uh, the, the charge is coming along. Now in this case that you're, oops, in this case that you're seeing right here, the magnetic field lines are going down like that. But now this time the magnetic field lines are going into the page. All right, so this charged particle is coming along. It enters a region of space where the magnetic field lines are going into the page. So it's going to feel a force on it, All right? What direction is the force going to be? Well, use the right hand rule. I, I want everybody to get out your right hands now and do the right hand dance, okay? So I want you to take your thumb and point your thumb so it's going the direction that the uh, charged particle is moving, okay? Um, you know, whatever, all right? So the thumb points that and then hold your fingers out straight. Now your fingers need to go into the page, okay? 
So thumb is going to the right, fingers going into the page. So your palm then, your palm then tells you what direction the force is going to be. So does everybody agree that the force is going to be going upward as we look at it in the picture here? Yes, you agree with that? Give me some yays or nays. Okay, good. I see some people agreeing. Okay, good. Okay, so now here's where it gets really interesting. Uh, so as it enters this magnetic field here, it's going to feel a force that's going upward. And so because of that, it's going to change its direction. As the direction changes, the force is going to change because the force is always going to be perpendicular, not only to the uh, the, the field lines, but also per perpendicular to the velocity. So what's going to happen is this thing is going to end up going around in a circular path very much like a planet going around the sun, okay? Imagine that in the center here, this black dot here is the sun, and out here, this is a planet. So as the planet goes along, it's always got a force which is pulling it uh, 90 degrees relative to the direction it's going. If it's going this direction, the force is like that. So as it changes its direction, the force changes with it. So this this uh, charged particle is going to come in here and it's just going to make a nice little semicircle and then it's going to pop out the other end and it's going to end up going uh, out back out into empty space in a direction that's exactly the opposite of what's what it started at. Okay. So, uh, so Yasna is asking why is B inwards? Well, okay, B is always 90 degrees uh, compared to what direction the thing is going. So if this is your charged particle right here, and this is the direction it's going, the magnetic field is always going to be 90 degrees from that. And so then as it changes its direction, magnetic field is that way, it changes its more, it's that way. So it's always, it's always going to be pointing uh, inwards like that. Does that answer your question, Yasin? Okay, good. All right. Okay. So now, uh, last night you really didn't have to calculate anything in your homework, but tonight you will. You're going to have to calculate what is the magnitude of the force that is acting on this charged particle. So what you see here is a page out of the book. I just took it right straight out of the book. The, the force on a charged particle. And if you look down at the bottom here, you'll see that the force is equal to QVB. So Q is how much charge is on the object. V is the velocity of the object, and B is the magnitude of the magnetic field. Remember, B is the number we use for magnetic field because the letter M was already used for too many other things. But the author of your book did not really tell you the whole truth here. Okay. F equals QVB only works if the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector are 90 degrees if they're perpendicular. If the angle between them is anything less than 90 degrees, you have to use the more complete formula. F is Q times the magnitude of the B vector. Remember when I put it in absolute value signs like this, okay, that means the magnitude of the vector. Okay, so Q times the magnitude of the v velocity vector times the magnitude of the magnetic field vector times the sine of the angle in between them, okay? So be careful. It's not always true that F is QVB. Now, if, if the, the angle is 90 degrees, the sine of 90 degrees is one, right? Okay, so the formula down on the bottom reduces down to be the same as the one up on top, but only if theta is 90 degrees. So the one on bottom is really, the, that's the one that you should learn is QVB times the sine of theta. Okay, so in my little drawing right here, you can see that the charged particle is moving in this direction. The, at this particular point right here, the magnetic field lines are pretty much perpendicular. So in this case, if you use F equals QVB, you'll, fi you'll be fine. Okay, so, so for this part is good, but what about over here? You see the problem over here? The velocity vector is the uh, kind of blue vector that you see here. 
the black line that you see right there, that's the direction of the magnetic field. And you can see those guys are most definitely not perpendicular to each other. So if you, if you used F equals QVB, you will not get the right answer this time. You have to multiply by the sine of theta. Okay. All right. Now, here, I've got the charge moving in a direction that is parallel to the magnetic field line. So in this case, the angle is zero. The sine of zero is zero. So that means in this case, that force is going to be zero. This guy, we've got a charged particle. He's moving through a magnetic field, but because the direction that he's moving happens to line up with the direction of the magnetic field, he will not feel any force at all. Okay. So give me thumbs up. Thumbs up, down, sideways. Mr. Hendricks. Yeah, go ahead. Because the um the lines are curved, how do we determine their direction? Well, what you do what you have to do is you have to look at each individual point. You have to say, at the point where the charge is at this particular moment, do they line up then? And if the answer is yes, then then there's no charge, no no force. Now, as the thing moves, it will move to a place where the, the line, the uh, field vector is no longer parallel to it, and so it will start to feel a force. Okay, so it's just at this instant in time, it won't feel a force, but as it keeps on moving, it will start to feel a force. Okay, so I'm seeing thumbs up from everybody. Okay, good. Okay. Now, up until now, we've been talking about a single isolated charged particle moving through space. What if you don't have a single particle moving through space, but what you have is you have a whole bunch of particles that are trapped in a wire. So what we've got is we've got electrical current flowing through a wire, okay? So notice over on the left side, it says plus, and over on the right side, it says minus. So on the left side, we're connecting that up to the plus side of the battery. On the right side, we're connecting it up to the negative side of the battery. So we're going to assume that the charges are flowing from left to right, even though we now know that actually what's really happening is actually, it's not positive charges flowing right to left, it's actually electrons, which are negatively charged, flowing the other direction. But, but we still stick with what we call the conventional current. Okay, all right, so we got these plus charges, they're moving through a wire, they're in a magnetic field, so we can use the right hand rule exactly like we did before. You want your thumb to be pointing in the direction that the current is moving, so current is moving from left to right, so your thumb points to the right. Notice the uh, magnetic field lines, they always come out of the north pole and go into the south pole, so they're going that way. So you agree that the uh, hand here the fingers are pointing the right direction. And notice that the palm is up, okay? So that means that this, as the electricity flows through this wire, this wire is going to feel a force pushing it up, okay? I hope that's clear. I don't see any questions, so I'll go ahead and move on, okay? So that same right hand rule that worked before still works, okay? So in your homework tonight, they're going to have uh, questions like this. Sometimes there'll be isolated charges just flying through space, but sometimes they will be the charges that are trapped in a current, uh, trapped in a wire, okay? And so uh, in this case, what we're going to use for our calculation is the number of coulombs per second that flow past a certain point. So electrical current is a lot like the current in a river. Okay, if you stand by the side of the river and you want to know what the flow rate of that river is, well, you can somehow try and calculate how many gallons per second are going past you, and that's how you measure the, the current in a river. Electricity works the same way. Uh, instead of counting how many electrons per second are going by you, uh, we count how many coulombs per second. So a coulomb of electrons is kind of the equivalent of a gallon of water, okay? All right, so we're gonna count how many coulombs per second. That's gonna be the current. We're gonna use the letter I to represent current. We don't wanna use the letter C to represent uh, current because C, C stands for coulombs, and, uh, and so that would be confusing, okay? 
And I know a lot of you guys have done things with electricity. And so you, you hopefully know that a Coulomb per second is the same thing as an amp, okay? And by the way, amp is actually an abbreviation. It's ampere is the official name, okay? So if, if you get a homework assignment where they say that the current flowing through a wire is three amps, what they mean is there are three coulombs per second flowing past that wire, okay? All right, so they're gonna ask you questions like this in the homework. Well, actually, okay, before we do that, we gotta know the formula. Okay, so the, the formula that we learned a few minutes ago, we said the force was equal to Q times the velocity times the B field, but in this case, we don't have individual charges, okay? So the way it works here is this equation that you see down at the bottom here, uh, the force is equal to I, which is how many coulombs per second, times L, which is the length of the wire that is contained within the magnetic field. I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute, times the strength of the B field. Okay, so again, the author isn't telling you the whole truth here. Uh, in reality, okay, that's only true if the wire and the magnetic field are perpendicular, okay? The more generally correct formula is this, okay? So it's I, which is how many coulombs per second are flowing, times L. Now the L vector is the vector that, in fact, I think I got another thing here. Okay, okay, so the L vector is shown right here, okay? This L vector that you see flashing here, okay, hopefully you see it flashing. Okay, good. There's a lag time here that's kind of annoying. Okay, so the L vector always points in the direction that the current is flowing, so it's gonna be parallel to the wire. The length of the L vector is equal to the length of the wire that is immersed in the field. Okay, so over on the right side, you can see the wire actually extends out a lot longer than my L vector, but I don't include any of this stuff in my calculations because that part of the wire is not immersed in the field. Same thing with over on the left side. L is only the length of the wire that is immersed in the field. Make sure you understand that. Okay, all right, so if we wanna know the force that's on the wire, we're gonna take I, which is how many coulombs per second, L times the length of the, the vector, which is immersed in the field, times B, which is the strength of the magnetic field, and then we, and then we are gonna have to have, we have to multiply it by the sine of theta, just like we did before. So that's the actual correct thing. Now, if I remember right in your homework tonight, it's always gonna be 90 degrees, but you should not be complacent because in the real world, it's very often not 90 degrees. Okay, so I trust you're good with this. I don't see any questions popping up, so I'm gonna continue on. Now, here is where we get to some real fun applications, really important applications. This uh, is something that's fundamental to our everyday life, okay? What we're going to do is we're gonna take a loop here and we're gonna, down here, we're gonna connect this up to a battery. So you can see that right now, we've got the, uh, the current flowing f away from us on the left wire, and it flows through the loop and then comes and it comes out the other end. So obviously what we've done here is we've taken a battery and we've hooked it up so that the positive side of the battery is connected to the left side of this loop. The negative side is connected to the right side of the loop, okay? And uh, Andre, I see you asked a question and somebody else answered the question for you, so good. Okay, so we've got current flowing through this loop. Now we know that when current flows through a wire that's in a magnetic field, it feels a force. So look at this and think about it for a minute. What's gonna happen to this loop? Okay, so you get out your right hands, okay? So look on the left side of the loop as the current flows through here. So put your thumb, so your thumb is pointing the direction that the current is flowing. Put your fingers so they're the direction that the B field is flowing. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna have to have our palm down. So that means that the, the left side of this loop is going to feel a force on it, pushing it downward. But on the right side of the loop, it's going the opposite direction. The force is coming back out. 
And so we put our thumb that way and our fingers for the B field, the B field is still going the same direction as it was before. So you see now what's gonna happen is that there's gonna be a force going up. So on the left side, it's getting pushed down. On the right side, it's getting pushed up. So what's gonna happen is this thing is gonna twist. So what we've just done is we have just created a motor. This is how electric motors work. So you like that? So what do you think? If, if I were to make a motor that's designed like you see on here, what do you guys think? Do you guys think I have a good motor or do any of you see a potential problem with this motor? And by the way, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, there is a very important problem with this motor. So let me, uh, let me throw it out to you guys. Do any of you see a problem with this motor? Okay, yeah, so, I do. So Kiker sees a slight problem. And uh, who was that? Was that? That was me, Josh. Okay, Josh, what's the problem that you see with it? So once you flip it, the currents will be switched. So the left side will be out and the other side will be in. And it'll just keep flipping back and forth. It won't make a full circle. It will not make a full circle. Actually, what's going to happen is it's going to come to a stop. So Hiram typed in something that, the, uh, Hiram, you got it exactly right. What's going to happen is, so that left side of the loop, it's got a force on it that's pushing it down. Once it gets to this point, it stays down. So if it goes a little bit beyond that, Okay, it still has it down. So, so okay, Josh, I see what you're saying. So Josh, you're 100% right. Okay, so what's gonna happen is that loop is gonna flip like this and it might overshoot it a little bit, but then eventually it's just gonna come to a stop with friction. So we've got a motor that nobody's gonna wanna buy. When we first turn on the motor, it'll, it'll turn a quarter of a turn and then it'll stop. It won't turn anymore. Who in the world's gonna buy a motor like that? Hmm. If only there was some way that we could modify our motor so that it would continue to turn just round and round and round. If only there was a way we could do that. Aha, okay, Milo, what is this commutator of which you speak? Can you turn on your mic, Milo? Hold, hold down the, uh, the space key or the space bar and uh, tell us verbally. What is this commutator of which you speak? The commutator is a ring of wires and in brushed motors, if you know what a brushed motor is, the two you guys, brushes. You guys, you, guys, you guys see the picture now? Okay, so, so I'm helping you out here, Milo. So yeah. go ahead and use this picture here and, and keep on going. So the commutator, what, what we just defined in the past picture is that the forces are gonna continue until it stops a quarter of the turn, right? Mm -hmm. But when it reaches that quarter of the turn, the commutator has two gaps in it. These, there's white strips over where the gaps okay, should Okay, in be. fact, let me zoom in on that. There, you see the gaps there? And so th because of those gaps, when it goes past that quarter turn, those gaps uh, slide along this brush and then it switches the polarity of okay. the current going through the loop. Okay, 100% correct. Okay, so the way that it is right now, in fact, let me back up a bit. Okay, so you can see the positive side here is connected right to here. So what's happening is that the positive charges are flowing out through here. They're touching onto the, this half of the ring, which is connected to the loop. So they're, they're flowing through the loop this way. So they're going through the loop counterclockwise, coming back up here, touching here, and coming out to the negative side of the battery. Now, if the, if the thing rotates a little bit, then this upper half of the ring is no longer going to be connected to the negative side of the battery. The upper half of the ring here, as it moves down here, it's going to be connected to the, to the positive side of the battery. And so then what's going to happen is the current is going to change directions. And, and so then this, what's going to happen then is in your motor, the current's going to flow this way for a little while until it turns and then it'll flow the other way. And so because of that, now you have a motor that somebody's actually gonna wanna buy because the, now you have a motor that will turn continuously, okay? So let me pause for a second here. Does anybody have any questions about that? I have a question. Okay, what's your question? If it keeps spinning, won't the, um, the wires get tangled up? No, because this, this commutator, you, you know, see how we call it a brush, okay? It's not actually welded onto the commutator, okay? It's just, it's just touching it.
Okay, so as the commutator slides by, the brush stays stationary, the brush doesn't move. The, the commutator, the ring, the ring slides by and these, imagine you've got a toothbrush where the bristles are made out of metal, so they're conductive, okay? So as the commutator slides by, the bristles are touching it, but they are not sticking to it, okay? So the wires will not get wrapped up. Does that answer your question? Yeah, totally. Okay, and I don't see anybody else. Okay, all right, good. Okay, so now we have a motor that's uh, actually pretty useful. All right, another application here. Um, let's say I've got two wires, and I've got, on the left wire, I've got current flow, so it's flowing from the bottom to the top. And on the white, right wire, I've got current, so it's flowing from the bottom to the top. Okay, I'm not sure why that would hurt your teeth there, Zach, but is there is there some is there some some noise that's uh, that's interfering? Is that what you're talking about, Zach? Okay. All right. So anyway, we've we've got uh, we've got current flowing through here. So remember, whenever you have current flowing through a wire, so he, so here's the wire, right? I have current flowing through the wire. So if I grab the wire with my thumb pointing that direction, my fingers curl. So both of these wires have a magnetic field around them. So as both the wires become magnets, if you got two magnets, they're either gonna attract or repel, right? Oh, the metal toothbrush is what hurts your teeth. Okay, I gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so you can, can you see how that these two wires now, because they have current flowing through them, they are going to become little magnets. Therefore, they will either be attracted or repelled. Now, in this case, what you see here, they're both flowing the same direction. And so it turns out in this case, the force is gonna be attractive. And the good way to think about it is look at the direction of the magnetic field. And remember that the arrow shown in the magnetic field, that, that tells you how to orient the, the magnet. So if you have an arrow pointing to the right, that means the north pole is on the right side, south pole is on the left side. Now in this case, in front of the wire, both of the magnetic fields are going the same direction. So I got two magnets here. So here I've got a north pole aligned with the south pole. They're going to attract each other. Now on the back side behind the wire, it's going to be same thing only flipped because the current's going the other way. But again, I got north pole, south pole. So if I have two wires, two parallel wires, if they are carrying a current and they're both carrying in the same direction, they will feel a force that attracts them to each other. If on the other hand, you got one current that's going one way, the other current is going the opposite way, they're gonna feel a force that repels each other. And if you think about it with the little magnets here, I would hope that it becomes obvious and that's why it works. Okay. Well, that's it for today's new material. Uh, don't forget to take the daily quiz. That's always a homework assignment. And uh, the questions are always really easy questions, or well, usually always uh, really easy questions. But you also do have a real homework assignment today too. And the real homework assignment is problems 16 through 25 on chapter 24. So Joseph wants to pick the secret word. Okay, Joseph, uh, I, will, I will let you, despite what Milo says, I will let you. Uh, de depending on what word you pick, it better be a good word. What's your word? Homework help? Is that is that the word or are you asking for homework help? Yeah. That's the word. Okay, so the word or the phrase in this case, that's two words. So Joseph, I'm a little bit worried about your counting abilities. Okay, so let's call it a phrase, not the word. So the secret phrase for today is homework help. I'll go along with that. Now, speaking of homework help, um, are you guys okay on your own with you know, because normally if you guys needed help on the homework, you would walk into my room during lunch or before school or after school. And I would, I would be, I would be eating my sandwich or whatever. So I'd stop eating my sandwich and I would help you. Obviously I can't do that anymore. Um, do you guys want me to do an online homework session or are you guys okay the way things have been going? Could you do one before we do the test on these next chapters? A homework? Oh, before we do the test? Yeah, for sure. Um, I will, what I'll do is I'll post uh, the uh, practice test and then I will, 
I will po uh, I'll have an online session where we'll talk about how to do it. And if people want additional uh, sessions, I'll do that. Okay, so Bridget is saying I, I can eat my sandwich. Uh, thank you, Bridget, I appreciate that. Um, if you need your help, could we set up a private Zoom meeting? Yes, yes, you could do that. So if you guys have any questions on the homework, uh, send me an email and I can easily set up a private Zoom meeting if, if we think that that's the best thing to do. Okay. Um, but as uh, unless I hear from other unless I hear from you asking for a private Zoom meeting, I will not I will not bother with this with that. Um, why is there a question mark after the twenty four? Did somebody do that, or did I do? Okay, okay. It looks like somebody's figured out how to play with the settings here. Uh, okay. Well, unless anybody has any questions, I'm going to turn off the recording and stop the meeting, but I'll give you a few more seconds to type in something. All right, Zach is saying adios, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I see I'm gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna have to play with the controls here. People have figured out how to write on the screen. Okay, that's nice, bye, see you later. Okay, so going once, going twice. Okay, so I will turn off the recording.